When we think of PR, we tend to think about marketing and general business announcements, earned media, paid media, all of that stuff. But today we're going to be talking specifically about press releases. And before you write it off as, no, that's not something I need, please tune in to all of this because Mickey gives some really interesting approaches to press releases specifically for business owners and entrepreneurs. But then toward the end, so you got to stay toward the end, he shares top strategy that podcasters have used to see success in sharing their shows. This is such a fun and interesting conversation. I feel like I learned so much about PR and I hope you do too. Please join me in welcoming Mickey to the show. Hello, Mickey. I am so excited to have you on the podcast today. If you could start by telling everyone who you are and what you do. Sure. So uh, my name is Mickey Kennedy. I'm the founder and president of eReleases. We specialize in press release distribution, sending out releases to the media through a wire. And I'm largely at this point lucky enough to be able to break away from the day-to-day operations and just talk about uh, the opportunities with PR and provide some good education because there's a, a lot of misinformation out there about press releases and news wires and things like that. Yes. Let's talk press releases, right? So in my head, I think press releases are for big businesses only. And I'm pretty sure that's a myth. So let's go ahead and start there. What is like with that misconception and who are press releases really for? Press releases are generally for anybody that wants to get an announcement to the media that they hope would be turned into an article. You know, that's the goal of press releases. It is, uh, we call it earned media when a journalist writes about you. That being said, you know, if you do a search for, you know, press release services and press release distribution, probably about 80% of the people on the internet are, uh, the goal isn't earned media, but actually syndication of the press release. And syndication happens with anybody that you use. Uh, With us, we partner with PR Newswire, which is the oldest and largest newswire of press releases. And you'll probably show up anywhere from 60 to 120 websites that post your press release, but it, it's not important. Those locations on these websites are, are not the places where they post their articles. You know, it's uh, usually a subdomain. If you went to that news outlet and did a search, your press release probably wouldn't even show up because it, it really isn't part of their article management system. And so for that reason, I find all of that a distraction. And those people are out there, they sort of permeate the space and confuse people with the idea that uh, your release is actually, you know, going somewhere and reaching people. You know, when you get an article, say, an example, the New York Times, you can potentially generate hundreds of customers, especially if you're in the B2C market and, you know, you'll get lots of leads from that, a lot of traffic, a lot of recognition. But generally when you are syndicated, it's quiet. You might get like four or five visitors, probably bots, and that's about it. So a press release is generally an announcement to the media. Uh, It's usually written in the third person. They're not very complicated. So I do tell people that, you know, try to write it yourself because there's a lot of samples and templates out there. We have them on our website as well. They're not elevated writing. And so it is one of the areas where I think that anybody can write a release. And going back to the original question of, you know, is it only for big companies? Absolutely not. Journalists have to usually cover the big, large companies in a market, but they usually don't get appreciation or accolades or people sharing that article because, you know, talking about the latest iteration of Microsoft Office isn't going to inspire a lot of people saying, wow, this is amazing. But if you showcase a new tool or a new service or product from someone you don't know anything about, people get excited by that. They do a lot of shares of those articles. They tell people about it. They also circle back to the journalists and give them lots of appreciation and accolades. And so journalists like to be seen as curators and they like to put the spotlight on a business and a product or service that no one knows. And for that reason, the people that journalists love to seek out and love to cover are the small businesses, the mom and pops, the the people no one knows about. You know, it's not unusual for people to even put the spotlight on, you know, non-companies like Kickstarter campaigns or Indiegogo. So do not discount that you're small as being a hindrance to you to succeed. In many ways, it's actually an advantage 
and probably will help you in regards to getting media coverage. That is really interesting. So what are some things that would make sense to say, oh, I should definitely do a press release for this product or this service? Uh, you mentioned like new iterations of something, something that's not really out there. Maybe you've got a patent for something. What What are some examples that we could use as like, oh, yeah, I did something like that and I didn't even think to do a press release? So I think that any major milestone is worthy of you know, sending a press release. If it's a new product or if it's product version two, even if it's pro product version 2.5, I feel like potentially could be a, a good milestone. It really is finding something that you think is important and you have a message that you feel the media is going to be excited about. And also that you've incorporated the elements in the press release for a journalist to write about you. I would say that like a product launch press release is one of the most common press releases we get at peer uh, at e releases and uh, that we send out over the wire. But, you know, most of these are, here's a product, here's a list of features, here's a page to learn more. And for a journalist, that's not a lot for them to write about. Journalists like a story arc. I think that most journalists, if you actually look at what they write, you know, since the beginning of time, we follow stories and we went to sleep as children hearing little stories. And uh, even when someone is sitting at the water cooler at work, they often share, oh, you won't believe what happened with this uh, plumber that came over. At the end, we don't expect, yeah, he came over and charged me a lot of money. It's like, what? We expect that there's a journey and that w there's a payoff at the end. And so the same thing with press releases, we want to make sure that we, when we send them out, that we are giving them the elements for a story arc. And, you know, going back to the product launch, what are the things that could help that? One is, you know, taking publicly available data and putting it in there to show the stakes of why this product is important. Let's say you have a logistics software solution and it's for the transportation industry. You could actually cite a publicly available number like, you know, 63% of new transportation companies fell within the first five years. Uh, because they just fail to achieve profitability and having a logistics software solution can get people to profitability by getting one of the biggest costs under control. And so all of a sudden that really shows, well, this is why this is important. Another thing that you can do is put a use case study. That's probably one of the most important things you could do there is share someone's experience using the software. Um, you know, what was their problem going into it? What was the outcome? You know, ideally a number or data point. And also have a quote by them of, you know, what, what it was like using it or how great it was or you know, just something favorable. And all of a sudden that gives a journalist more to work with. They can say, Hey, here's a new software. Here's a company that used it. And they went from this to this. And here's a quote by them and maybe a sentence or two about some of the features. But that really fills out more of the requirements that journalists are looking for. But when it comes to press releases, many of them write them as, this is what I want, this is the way I wanna position everything. And you know they send it to the world without thinking about, does it satisfy the needs of a journalist? You know, A journalist is a gatekeeper deciding, does this entertain or educate my audience? And ideally you want it to be able to do both. And if it doesn't, do either of those things, what can you add to that release that would more satisfy both of those elements? And uh, that's one of the most important things. And I think that one of the reasons that people who write from selfish standpoint don't realize why PR is not working for them. Mm, that's so interesting. As you were talking, I was thinking through like two different types of businesses that I've seen and like big things that they've done and how they maybe could use their press release strategically. So the first one I was thinking was like a women's uh, jewelry line where they are curated a certain way for a certain type of woman. Maybe there's some emotional element to it, right? So like as the business owner, she might think like this woman who's owning this business might think, oh no, it's just another product launch. But like, this is a great way to share your story, get your story out there. You might not think it's interesting, but guess what? There are going to be people out there who are going to think it's interesting. And then the other one was, I have recently heard this. I want to say it was an agency, like a marketing agency in the UK. And they did a interview of like 250 agencies and then created a white paper based off of that. And I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, please, <laughs> taking one part of that huge white paper that they created as like, here are the mistakes that a lot of agencies are making in their marketing, taking one element of that paper, 
doing a press release about it and then having that story, having that thing that 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 reporter can then send people to for more information or the reporter can look through for more validated information. Would that be like another idea that for someone who's more of a service provider? Absolutely. That is a very strong idea. Uh, it's a lot of work to put something like that together. But uh, certainly, if you go through and you pick out opportunities, like you said, a number of mistakes uh, to avoid, or, you know, uh, best practices or top 10 ways to do something that are built off of a, a white paper like that, you can uh, send those out and again, have that link. And you, you'll, like you said, you'd be surprised the number of places that would then include a, a link uh, to a resource like that. There are a lot of companies uh, in, in the news space that their policy is we don't link to anything. And the New York mm -hmm. Times is one of those that says we don't link to people. But despite that, they did link to a resource just like that in a press release that we did. So I was able to get one over nice. on them. But it's because they saw the value of it, that it was mm -hmm. so enormous. And they just know that it's a dead brainer. You know, they're not sending them to a page to buy, but they're sending them to a page with just a, a tremendous resource or value there. So it, it's a really great way to get links out of people that you normally wouldn't have. You know, sort of building off of that, uh, one of the easiest ways to get media or maybe not easiest, but one of the ways that I've had that has never failed is to do a survey or study within your industry. And it's sort of borrowing a little bit about what, you know, that white paper was about. It's generally, you know, asking some meaningful, timely questions in your industry right now you know, I, I recommend, you know, putting it in Survey Monkey. you end up with a link. Yeah, I like 12 to 16 questions, four questions per page. So if someone stops yeah. halfway, you still have the responses. And then take that link and then go approach a smaller independent trade association in your industry. They are out there. You probably don't even know about them. Uh, everyone knows the large ones. They're not very receptive to these kinds of arrangements. But if you go to one of these others, you're looking for ones probably between 500 and members and up. Uh, and just approach them and say, hey, um, I'm, I'm doing a survey um, in my industry. Here's the link. If you could send this out to your members and we get at least 100 responses, I would love to include you in a press release we will be issuing over PR Newswire in the near future. We generally uh, reach out to these uh, trade associations with that message. About two thirds of them say yes, because they don't, no one knows about them and they don't get a lot of attention. And so they will gladly send it out. And uh, but by the way I positioned it, we're looking for a hundred responses. If we don't get a hundred responses, I circle back with them and say, Hey, could you do another push social media email or something to try and get us up closer to that hundred number? Cause they know that otherwise it just may not be worth the trouble of, of, of relying on that population for this, the survey. And then, you know, you're going to pick what was the biggest aha moment, what's mm -hmm. the biggest surprise of that survey and focus on that on the press release. But you're going to build out a page on your website where you put all the questions and responses because you might find journalists click through and it's question five that they really like and they want to build an article around that. So include all that data. You're going to have a amazing quote in your press release where you talk about why the numbers skewed a particular way. Topics that are really popular right now are, you know, we're, we're, we're considerably out of the pandemic, but it seems like workplace culture has changed forever. Uh, but you could ask questions around that, you know, getting, you know, are people not wanting to, to, to work in the office any longer? You know, how are you navigating stuff like that? Mm -hmm. uh, you could ask around AI. I mean, there are a lot of industries that are really afraid of how AI is uh, affecting them. And, you know, yeah. asking graphic artists, do you feel that AI is going to hurt your business over the next five years could could lead to some interesting responses. And, you know, then send that release out. And generally when we do this, we usually get between like eight and 14 earned media articles. The least we've ever seen that I've coached someone through is four, um, but that was for someone in the biometric space, which I think is kind of narrow and, and very particular, but it, it always works. And it's, you know, positions you as an expert. So it's a really great way for you to be elevated in the industry. And the, the real magic is just picking those great questions and then focusing on the one that you think is probably going to interest people the most as to why, why they felt that way and what is the reasoning behind that. When you say trade associations, for someone who's not in that space, could you explain? <laughs> 
Right. So every industry has a trade association. I talked to someone once about this and she's like, well, Mickey, in our field, there's only Public Relations Society of America. And I had to break it to her. There's like 470 other trade associations in the United States alone. But uh, a lot of them are fractured, uh, like mid-Atlantic PR firms or, you know, even all different types. Uh, Some of them allegiances to certain universities or the size of the PR firms, I think is a really good one uh, because there's some that are, you know, are for PR firms of, you know, say 50 employees or less. It's probably the majority of the market. I mean, yeah, there's a, a dozen or so really large PR firms, but you know, the bulk of PR firms across the country are smaller. So I, I would probably navigate towards one like that. But you know, wh- what is your industry? What What is it that you do? I mean, if you sell peanuts, literally, there are probably several associations for the peanut or agricultural industry, or there might be agricultural trade associations of which you know, peanuts uh, is, is in there, you know, just sort of pick one that you feel is, is, is really good. But every space seems to have many of them that people just don't realize. Uh, uh, someone opened my eyes to that many years ago. And I just realized that these associations are just out there. And so few people know about them. And they are starving for uh, visibility themselves. And they're often eclipsed by a much bigger trade association that the majority of the industry knows very well and most people probably belong to. Um, but uh, you know, do keep these other ones in mind because they're great to work with. When they send an email out, the members are like, yeah, well, we don't get a lot of requests from the smaller association. So they, they feel more likely uh, you know, to, to get engaged and actually do a favor for them. So you mentioned like you were, you were putting up your press release and then what's the process from there? Do you just kind of hope? It is. Or, it is a little bit of, of, of God, being available crazy. and then following up with any leads that come in. The majority of, of journalists don't reach out to you unless they have questions or need clarification. They'll just take the press release, uh, look at your website and try to write an article based on that. They hate having to go back to you because <laughs> so many times it's like playing, you know, uh, the game of phone and back and forth. And it's hard to get someone in time. You know, now there's a ticking timeline and deadline and things like that. So it is kind of important to put the necessary elements there. But it is kind of like you just hit send and you wait. If uh, your most likely pickup is in, say, trade magazines or print the lead time can be a little bit longer. Of course, not with newspapers, but you know, magazines that are and trade publications that are monthly. It, it could be a couple of months before you see that article uh, get generated. And you know, if it comes to, to weeklies, it could also be a, a few weeks as well. So you have to be a little bit patient, but you know, generally you, you have a pretty good indicator of how things were because it usually follows that if you get are getting some trade publication pickup there usually is a couple of newspapers in there as well. And so those usually happen pretty quickly, but uh, it, it is all over the place and, and somewhat, uh, you know, hard to predict, you know, the value of it is if you have something that's kind of very newsworthy, you can get a lot of pickup, you know, the mm-hmm. case study I have on my website. The first one is for an initiative called the dining bond initiative that was set up to help restaurants during the pandemic. And it was just a very short lived effort, but you know, they wanted to get the message out. So I, I sent the release out for free to help them out and, you know, just hit send once and over a hundred places picked it up. And it was a lot of newspapers, a lot of big newspapers, a lot of big publications, a lot of uh, food ma- trade uh, magazines and things, some of which uh, anybody would recognize. And it did really well, generated over $10 million in revenue to help individual restaurants across the country. So huge success. And the only marketing that was really done was PR. And so that's a, you know, really shows that if you have a message that really resonates, it can go large and do really well. Looking at that one, it did really well because we were sent home uh, for two weeks to flatten the curve and we didn't know what was going on. There was a lot of uncertainty and negative news. And here was something really positive. And even more importantly, it was actionable. We Mm -hmm. felt like we were powerless at home. And here was something you could do. Like if you had a favorite restaurant uh, you and your spouse went to on your anniversary every year, you could give them $50 and it would go immediately to them if the volunteers were able to make contact with them. 
and it would be backed sort of with a dining bond or you know gift card type of situation. And so it was very successful and a lot of fun to see the success of that. And that just shows the leverage opportunity is there when you go over a wire that it can go really far and large. And I'd mentioned that e-releases goes out uh, nationally through PR Newswire. Um, that is the oldest and largest newswire press releases. In the U.S., we have a duopoly. The other um, wire is business wire. And if you go and do a search, you'll probably find 30, 40 companies with wire in their name in this space. But there's only two that journalists go to. And it's the, those are the two ponds they fish in. There was a third player that came out and made some inroads in the past. But um, at that time, journalists uh, started to be expected to do more with less. And going to a third wire was just too much work for them. And so that wire pivoted and now focuses on publicly traded companies that don't want journalists really paying too much attention to their announcements. They're just happy to have the release show up on Yahoo Finance and MarketWatch when you type in the sticker and meet SEC uh, disclosure requirements. And so there are wires that people probably have heard uh, that are not news wires or press releases. Uh, AP, Associated Press, uh, UPI, United Press International, Reuters, and there's a few others. They work differently. They do not transmit press releases over them. Um, they write all of the articles and uh, then they make them available to newspapers and other media outlets to just take and put in their newspapers and pay a licensing fee, or maybe they already have a licensing arrangement with them. And so rather than have the Baltimore Sun at 5.30 in the afternoon have to sit down and write about a, a, a late Supreme Court ruling that day, they could just pull it from the Associated Press. They know it's going to be a quality article and uh and run with it and so yeah. um you know that that's the differences between those types of wires um here in the u.s that is interesting yeah there's so much more that goes into it than i think i ever really realized <laughs> so that is fascinating i'm thinking too we had someone on don't remember his foundation or nonprofit. But his name's Donald Dunn, and he does nonprofit specifically for veterans. And just thinking about all the initiatives that he has done, the success that he's had, but all I know a lot of it has been his own time, effort, and money. And so a press release would be a great way <laughs> to get these initiatives that he's doing out into the world, right? So if you're doing those types of things, but for maybe our other podcasters who are trying to figure out, well... I kind of want to do this. I want to see what would be a good idea. I'm curious, would a podcast launch or some type of podcast, video, blog, new mini series be something newsworthy? I'm, I'm putting up bunny ears for the people who are not watching the video. Is that something newsworthy or do we need to dig a little deeper? I think you might have to go a little bit deeper. It, it is something that normally doesn't get covered with the media very often. The exceptions are ones that are attached to people that are really well recognized or the theme that they're doing is really interesting. Um, I, the last podcast I saw that did really well was a limited series that involved Abraham Lincoln. But, okay. you know, it, it, it got a lot of people involved, you know, <laughs> History uh, Channel and other, uh, I think either NPR or PBS covered them as well in uh, articles. And so outside of that, you know, there is the sensational, um, there, there was the former lawyer for Trump that went to jail for a while. He, he did a press release when he was interviewing Stormy Daniels. And of course that got picked up everywhere, but you know, for the average podcaster that that's not going to be it. I think that, you know, baby talking about your story, I think you had mentioned that before. And I, I didn't really qualify that your story is extremely important. There is a reason that every time someone appears on Shark Tank, the first thing they do is share their story. And yeah. oftentimes it's a vulnerability. It just cuts through the clutter. They share, you know, that you know they, they were going through a divorce or they lost a father or they were laid off or something happened or it's just an unusual story or a, a little novelty or something. And they indulged it and then thought maybe there could be a business here. And the reason that all of them do this is because it immediately cuts through and it creates this human interest element. It sort of mm -hmm. builds this empathy. And we like to relate to people. We don't like to relate to logos and companies and things like that. Uh, that is really important. So if you talk about your podcast, what was the podcast journey? What inspired it? Tell us about you. What's your story? What's idiosyncratic about you? Uh, what's weird? What's embarrassing? What, you know, any of these things, you just be vulnerable 
and just put it out there. That tied to a launch could definitely increase the chances considerably that you could get uh, picked up and, and, you know, and talk about that. Other elements that you could potentially do are to talk about things that go against the grain. You know, mm. if uh, you gave someone your topic, there's an expectation of what people would expect the topics to be. Maybe go in and be a little contrarian and sort of talk about, well, there are a lot of podcasts in this space and many of them talk about X, Y, Z. My spin on it is I'm going to talk about this. And all of a sudden like, ooh, that's, that's kind of interesting. That's a little bit different. And so potentially that could work. Yeah. Another thing I've seen some podcasters do that works, and it's surprising how well this works. It's not going to work with the New York Times. It's not going to work with a lot of the big news outlets. But when you go on the wire, it's full of, you know, every newspaper nationwide it goes to the wire. So you can take basically a, a finished article format and send it out as a press release. But the one I've seen that works really well is top 10 podcast in your niche. And mm -hmm. so if your niche is podcast marketing, you could say, you know, so-and-so has released the top 10 list in uh, discusses podcast marketing, and then put nine of the 10 podcasts that everyone expects to be there, that anybody would recognize the really big ones, the, the ones that people want. It shows that you've researched it well, you know the subject matter really well. These are a very tight nine that you should see and buried within there, you're going to be the 10th one. Your <laughs> podcast is going to be in there. I've seen so many people copy and paste those top 10 list and include them on uh, in, in their uh, newspapers and other places. It's just great free content. They've got a little bit of space. They copy and paste that, you know, even trade publications and stuff like that will do that. And when they see so many good ones, they just assume they're all good. And so you might be new, and but why not? I, I've seen that work many, many times. And it's just a way to sort of just enclose yourself. It, I call it sort of like putting the pill in the cheese. You know, you've surrounded yourself with this really delectable thing that they see as really great content. And they don't notice that you're that little pill down there that, you know, may not have yet proven yourself in the yeah. space. But a lot of people are going to say, read it and say, oh, I know most of these. Oh, what's this one? I haven't seen it. They will gravitate to you. And you don't have to put yourself as number one or at the end, just bury yourself somewhere in there. That is such <laughs> a great way. And I'm giggling over here because I'm like, oh, that's so sneaky, but so awesome. I love I love that. And you're saying it works. So uh, you heard it here first, guys. I think too, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about when I launched my second podcast with my sister. And I've talked about this story before, but um, I grew up in a cult. So I could have very easily, you know, thrown it. There are so many true crime podcasts out there or podcasts about cults. And my sister and I had a podcast called Two Sisters and a Cult, still out there. We just haven't produced anything in a very long time. But when we launched, we could have put a press release out. Sister Cult Survivor Duo launches new <laughs> podcast on cults. I'm like, that's a great idea. But even thinking about like people who think, oh, well, my story is not good enough. I'm thinking about one of my clients where he could do a press release about her story where, you know, her mom had... Uh, I want to say it was Alzheimer's or dementia, one of the two. And she was a caregiver to her mom while also a brand new mom herself to two littles and was trying to be productive and live fully and also not burn out. And now her business is all about productivity the way you need it, not hacks, not 10 top ways or organize your life or Marie Kondo it. None of that. It's what is going to work best for you, for your family, for your situation. And so it's very custom. And like, that's a great approach to be like, I'm showing up different. I'm anti all those lists of ways to have be more productive. And here's my podcast about all of this stuff. So that would be a great, I think, example, correct me, please, if I'm wrong, of a way to really infuse your story and then kind of sprinkle your podcast in there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So fun. Is there anything else that it's like, don't forget this thing, though, please. <laughs> if you're sending out a press release, we need to make sure that we have this. I think the big thing is to be strategic. Put your creative hat on. I have a, a master class where I go through several types of strategic types of releases because uh, one of the biggest criticisms of press releases that I've heard 
for over 27 years is that they don't work. And yet I see them work again and again, but I would agree that 97% of press releases out there probably don't generate earned media. And mm -hmm. so what I do is I focus on the 3% that do work and I try to find the patterns within them. And there are lots of patterns and that's what that free masterclass is about. It's a hour long video. I, I made it small because the last time I bought a 20 hour video class, I never finished it. So <laughs> yeah. uh, if anyone's interested in that, it's at ereleases.com slash plan, P-L-A-N. And again, it's free, small commitment. And if you don't know much about PR, probably the best place to start because you can do an audit of your business through these strategic ideas and see which ones resonate with you. And that way, if you do you know, a PR campaign, which I always recommend that if you're considering PR, do a proper campaign of six to eight releases. Um, you don't have to do them in six to eight months. You can take whatever is logical for your business and the cadence that works for you. So maybe it's doing a press release every two months or three months or at a staggered basis. But you know, do six to eight releases, all of them on completely different ideas and testing different approaches, strategic approaches. And generally, I would say if you follow most of the strategic ideas I have of the six to eight that you do, probably two to four are going to generate real earned media. Um, you know, the real the, the real secret is that not every press release is going to generate earned media. And you learn from that and you move on and you try different approaches and see that does. And uh, there's there's no reason why, you know, if you do a campaign of six uh, to eight releases that you can't get two to four of those to generate some real articles and some real attention for you. And, you know, hopefully it could bring some sales. Uh, hopefully it can bring some leads. But even more importantly, when you have that earned media, you can share it with your existing leads and you will increase your conversions. You can share it with your customers and it will reduce churn. Those people that have used you for a while and this year we're gonna shop around are now less likely to do that. And also with potential incoming leads, putting that in front of them will increase the conversion rate with them. It really does make them feel like you are someone that is on their game, knows what they're doing. You know, earned media is social proof. It's almost like an implied endorsement when a journalist chooses to write about you. And so it's a huge signal of trust and much more effective than testimonials and other things and really breaks through with people and makes them energized and, and really makes them want to work with you. That's so good. And thank you so much for giving us that link for the masterclass. I think that's going to be really good for people is just like a starting point. Um, because this is a lot of information, especially if you're not in the space, <laughs> being like, wait, my head hurts now. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> so this gives us some really actionable things we can do. We'll make sure that we also have the link for that in the show notes and the blog post. That way, anyone who's driving or doing other things can access it. Mickey, thank you so much. Where can people find you, get to know you, hang out with you on either social media, your website, etc.? So uh, the website's ereleases.com. All of my social media is on the lower right, including my direct LinkedIn, which is probably the best social media for me personally. But uh, again, feel free to call or email or chat on the website. Uh, we don't have any salespeople. We don't have any commissions or quotas. It's just editors that you would talk to. And if you have a release that you've written and you're still not sure who to send it with, feel free to send it along to us. Just uh, take a look at it, allow a couple business days to get back to you. But that's something we do, whether you end up working with us or not. Uh, we're just available. We want to help people work, uh, especially small businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, we want you to be successful. And uh, we, we, we're really out there to help make a meaningful difference for uh, basically anybody who's looking to engage with uh, public relations and press releases in particular. Thank you. Oh, that's so wonderful. And thank you so much for being on the show. You've given us so much value and some actionable things that we can do and take from here, especially if we're looking to get more earned media this year. And I think that's such a great way for podcasters and business owners to grow. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.